There's a cat over here. There's a cat over there. And the wrong one died. And the wrong one died. Welcome to The Wrong Cat Died, the podcast breakdown of the cat catastrophe. I'm your host, Mike Abrams, and today we have another amazing guest. He was Skimble Shanks on the fifth U.S. national tour of Cats. So welcome, Felix Hess, and thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> I am excited. I do uh, I do love talking about Skimble, and so <laughs> I, it's always fun. But let's start at the beginning. What okay. is your cat's history? Like, when did you see it first? What was your experience before you became a cat? <laughs> um, well, cat, Cats has always been a part of my life. When I, when I was a kid, it was the very first musical that I saw. Um, I grew up uh, just outside of Philadelphia, so I saw it at the Forest Theater in Philadelphia for the very first time. Um, actually had an interesting experience with my mom taking me that we went to get a bite to eat before the show. And I didn't know there was a musical about it. She just introduced me to the book, Old Possum's Book of Practical Cats. So I would just flip through the book and look at the Edward Gorey illustrations and just became obsessed with that. And then she let me know, there, you know, there's a musical about this, right? And started listening to it and it came to the Forest Theater. So she took me. Um, and the bar next door, we went to get something to eat. And we noticed two guys with cats duffel bags and we were saying, do you think they're in the show? And the Rum Tum Tugger is my favorite as it is everybody's favorite cat in the entire world. Um, <laughs> but we asked them, so are you in the, well, my mom had the, <laughs> had the uh, uh, bravery to ask. I was a little too shy at the moment um, to ask, are you guys in the show? Yeah, we're in the show. We're just on our way there now. Um, which cats you play? The Rum Tum Tugger. <gasps> and I died and fell out. I was like, it's you, it's you. Oh my God. Um, and so that was my first experience before even seeing the show. Um, so I saw that when I was very young, uh, and then just always, always the trajectory was towards doing it, towards being in it. The leg warmers, wearing the makeup, putting the hair on, doing the unitard, the lights, the sound, the magic was always, always the trajectory. Um, so I was in college at the time. Uh, I decided to take a little bit of break from school cause I was getting a little burnt out from doing too much. Uh, and was just auditioning and it came up and I auditioned for it and I got it. They called me and I went out on the road. Uh, two th I joined the cast in 2006 um, wow. is when I joined the tour and so, then continued doing that for another two years solid as Skimble, uh, understudying two roles and then came back two more years after that under understudying many, many, many a role. <laughs> yeah. So how old were you the first time you saw it? You said you were young. Yeah. Um, Probably, probably eight or nine, I would say. Okay. Around that age. Like and enough you, to kind of know, but not know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So enough to not fully understand. So that that's always my question because I've argued uh, at length. I don't think that this is for children. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> and, and because I now know the story and like how absurdly dark it can be mm -hmm. and it's like i get the blissfulness of like as your kid you don't catch any of that stuff you don't notice any of that stuff mm -hmm. but when you were like a, a huge fan as an eight-year-old mm -hmm. when you then book it and you get told the backstory <laughs> yeah did you kind of look back on that experience and say like oh man i never picked up any of that it was just fun cats singing and dancing <laughs> um i think probably at that age i knew there was something there was something going on, something buzzing around in my body that was new and different, I guess is a way to say it. Um, but there was definitely maybe that I was too young to put words in it, but there was definitely something that I guess I didn't know to think of it as sexual at the time, but there's definitely like a darkness, a sexuality to it, a, um, a ferocity, uh, 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 what is it called? Like an untameness to this thing. Like there's something that I'm not supposed to be seeing, but I'm seeing it. Yeah. yeah, which, you know, it's kind of interesting you say that because that's a lot of the, like cats are just you're lucky to be there type <laughs> yes. of like be like part of the show. Mm -hmm. But I definitely as I started because I didn't see it as a kid. Mm. I never saw I didn't you know, I my first introduction was 2016. OK. And it was just I know this has been around forever. I should go <laughs> now see <and> it. Forever. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I should go see it. And I had no idea what I was going to see. And so I didn't realize. And then I watch and there's kids everywhere and everything. I'm going that that looks like uh like they're having sex on stage basically yeah. and that looks like an orgy and yeah. i was like and they're gonna murder one of these cats to end the show mm -hmm. i was like this is not the story mm -hmm. i you know there's there's frozen and there's the lion king and all these other shows <laughs> that you can go see 
and we're going to go see this one. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've kind of always struggled with that. And the more I've – like my whole uh, – my knowledge base of the show is still just the plot. And when you mm-hmm. really break down the plot, it's not a kid's show. No, it's this not. It's as NC-17 as you can get. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's – I think what – what it appeals to kids about, of course, the lights, the sound, and the costume. And it's one of those shows that the more you dive into it and more you kind of know what's going on, it's it's why it's one of those shows people come back and see again and again. It's because you always see something different. And especially talking about Central Clump, which is the orgy in the in um, in the ball, or electrocuting a cat as the finale, or just shooting one up into space at the end, you start to learn the see those little things and start to connect the dots. That's what I think brings people back, especially as adults. Um, but as kids, you just kind of see everything happening at once. And, you know, you you can't take that all in because it's so much. Yeah. <laughs> I want to I want to make sure I highlight exactly what you just said there, because <laughs> I know what that means now, because I've heard enough. I've talked to enough cast members, but you just said the word sensual clump. Yes. As is as in that is a part of the show. That is a that section in taught, the ball. It is called it's sensual section, clump. It's a section of the show. I, that blew my mind when I heard that the first time. <laughs> that, that is the that's it. This is a sensual clump, and mm-hmm. that is yeah. And let's bring eight year olds to the show. Yeah, <laughs> let's see them all move together and then throw their hands up. <laughs> did you um, did you ever do you know who that tugger was? Did you ever get to interact with um, that tugger outside a- of that? bar experience uh, that's a good question i actually should go look that up after we finish talking um i have to i have to call my mom and remind myself when like what year that actually was and look that up i i don't know his name to be honest okay um, that's a good question <laughs> yeah yeah so okay so you book it you book it basically during college and yes. you go you end up doing four years mm-hmm. mostly a skimble but who else did you uh cover um my first two years i understudied uh Monka strap and uh tugger and then um, when I came back, uh, I started understudying more roles. Uh, I started understudying Alonzo um, and then Plato McCavity. Uh, and then, then just uh, out of necessity for the road, because, you know, people get injured out on the road, stuff like that. I started covering kittens. So I, I've performed Mungo Jerry. I've done Pounceable. I've done Tumble Brutus. Who else? Basically all, all the cats except uh, Deuteronomy and for Mistopheles. I actually had an opportunity, which was a once in a lifetime opportunity. I got to go on as Gus once that it was chips are down. Everybody's out, like (laughs) get ready, (laughs) put me in the fat suit and everything like that. And I I actually got to go out and perform Gus one night, which was really a dream come true. Wow. And did you, did you win as Tugger too? I'm assuming, right? Tugger. Yes. Yes. I've been Tugger many times. Fulfill your dream, your (laughs) your eight year old dream Mm -hmm. and to go on as Tugger. (laughs) Yeah, my Mick Jagger fantasy. <laughs> clap, clap, feather, feather. Yeah, exactly. So I, I love hearing a little bit about like with your tour, I've talked to a lot of the most recent tour. I've talked to a lot of the 2016. I've now talked to a lot of 1987. I, I've not talked to as many people from the, the fifth tour. Mm-hmm. What was your, what were you told? Like what was the explanation of the story that you were told, especially like what is Skimble's story? Um, because I, I found it. There's the three words that everyone always tells me about, but I'm curious to hear because every production has a slight different take. Mm-hmm. Um, I got. I never got the three words moment. I know what you're talking about though, but I got a postcard. Uh, not a postcard, but like a, a well, a postcard that had a sentence on it that he is. Um, he's a leader. He's an elder in the tribe. Uh, he is uh, official on the cat on the um, the Midnight Mail uh, railroad line. Um, he's in charge. He likes to keep things neat and tidy and everything orderly and moving forward. Um, and my impressions of him that I started to put in, especially in the song, if you start breaking down the lyrics, that he's a very world travel person. Um, he kind of knows the ins and outs. He can see things before they're happening. So he's kind of your inside man always. He's always mm-hmm. the guy with the VIP tickets. He's always the guy making sure you get in or don't get in or making sure the right people get in. Um Kind of like that, a hipster of the world, I guess, is a way you can okay you can look at it. <laughs> Interesting. I, so that's, I mean, I, I find it fascinating because that's like the personality and persona. I, I my Skimble uh, episode, I, I kind of called him the creepy uncle, and I think that is <laughs> that's gotten that, that's what that has definitely rubbed a few Skimbles wrong. Of course. Uh, but <laughs> but I, I am curious, what was like? How much do they tell you beyond that? Of like, this is a personality. This is more of the like. 
do they tell you at all about cat's family tree or who's with who or who you should be like annoyed with or love or or brother and sister with or any of that like how much of that is is broken down for you um not the year that i did it not very much you're basically given the the bullet points of the characters mm-hmm. and you know like mccavity is bad and grizabella's here and monka straps the leader and tugger's like the guy um and you know skimble is the uncle that keeps things going and keeps things in charge um and kind of uh overextends himself a little too much uh but in terms of creating relationships and stuff like that the the years that i did it was left a lot up to interpretation we were told blocking wise where to be when to go when who you're with so based on who you're with because usually year to year you're with the same cats Mm -hmm. um or kittens or whoever you're around in that moment that you tend to build the same relationships but each each relationship between the actors becomes unique in its own way so that's that i think is i I find that so fascinating as someone who's not a performer not an actor (laughs) not involved in any of this stuff how much do you then fill in the blanks because you're given you're given a little bit and then Mm -hmm. you've got to go out and do this performance every every night Mm -hmm. how much else do you add and if so like what did you add um for me uh just because it's a lot of body work in cats, obviously moving uh, to create image, especially because you're so small and being a tiny orange dot running around the stage, you want people to know which one is which. Mm-hmm. Um, so I started adapting certain mannerisms, especially thinking about like when a cat stands up, um, they wouldn't have their arms necessarily out to the side or so much over their head or reach behind them. Um, thinking of keeping my arms in because, you know, if you pick up a cat, it kind of brings its shoulder up and its arms kind of hang it doesn't really have control of it so when it stands up i would keep my arms in and keep my hands nice and tidy and also kind of official keeping them together people people would say it looked like i carry i was always carrying around like a tiny gift box in my hand (laughs) (laughs) right keep my hands together and um just be very proper and ready to go uh because being skimble in the ball with the whole ritual of the evening it's um a ceremony so his job is kind of to keep things going so there's there's a joy in the familiness of being part of the Jellicles for Skimble, but there's also an officialness that's necessary. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, what other types of things? Just ways of standing up, ways of holding your hands um, that I would keep my fingers in because cats don't have fingers, they have claws. So um, Suzanne Viverito, who is one of the uh, uh, assistants that helped t- teach me the show when I was first learning it, um, she explained to me, so when you have a cat, when a cat has doesn't have fingers, they have claws. So whenever you have your fingers out, your claws are out. And a cat only has its claws out when it's defending itself. So make sure you make that choice. If your claws are out, if your fingers are out, that that reads a different way versus keeping them in and keeping the paw scenario. So I found myself kind of keeping my hands in this kind of ape knuckle dragger type of situation where I keep the um, top half of my fingers in and even crawling around keeping keeping my paws in and keeping my claws in unless i needed them Hmm. (laughs) i guess it's a way to say that (laughs) yeah what about like the the other kind of like backstory writing Mm -hmm. did you think about are you like one rumor is that you are potentially married to jenny uh i there is definitely a connection between the two i try and stay away from terms like married because there are cats. I mean, there are people yeah. dressed as cats, but they are cats at the end of the day. So the idea of married in the animal world doesn't exist. So fair, totally yeah. fair. So that's how the way the stuff. written rumor mill right now. It's <laughs> like these two are together. They're married. This is somebody's adopted cat, like son. There's a lot of like very human ish writing into the rumor mill. So that's very fair. Okay, so but maybe you're just together. Are you together? Yeah, of course. There's definitely a connection. There's definitely a sensual connection or um, a familiarity because they've known each other for so long and they're watching all the kids. And, you know, I'm sure they grew up together and knew each other, all that stuff. Um, But with any like cats relationships, I always try and go back to like the feralness and the animality of everything because that's what kind of drew me to the show in the first place <laughs> that unspoken like weirdness that, yeah you know, <laughs> even as i look through some of the other rumors of like you're one of them is rumple teasers uncle and it's like well yeah they're you're probably uncle of everybody because they're probably all, all <laughs> everyone's got a little orange in yeah, everyone, <laughs> out of me in some capacity um yeah, and the other one is, is that someone one of them is your adopted son which that one really threw me that rumor threw me it's corporate cat is that how you pronounce it? I always pronounce uh, it. Coracopat. Coracopat. Yeah. 
when I read that rumor, I was like, adopted son just seems yeah. so weird. But it is on the rumor mill of that. Okay. That's that's one of the relationships. Yeah, and I never um, understood the, that. Um, the year the year that I did the show, um, there weren't as many cats as like the full full company of cats, so we didn't have a quarter cat. Uh, so, so I never got to experience yeah, you that didn't, rumor. You didn't, <laughs> you didn't get to adopt them. I didn't get the chance. Um, I, I would have taken them in though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's talk about a couple things in your song. Because I've sure. asked this question to a couple other skimbles, and I and I've gotten, I've gotten okay answers. As in, okay. like people have tried to convince me where I'm wrong, but I'm t- I want to go through what I witnessed or what sure. I felt I saw, versus what I now know is probably not reality. But okay. at one point in the song, it looks like you're changing. Yes. What is that? Talk me through what's happening there. Um, that is, uh, I assume, uh, what is that part? It was very pleasant when he found his little den, that part. Um, so that part is just showing the cats, the kittens, because it's a teaching moment. Uh, the kittens have never seen the railroad, or they're just meeting Uncle Skimble for the first time. He's, he's telling the story. He's showing them what the cabin looks like and making fun of the humans at the same time. Like, can you believe they did this and they need all this? And like, this is how they change. And stuff like that. So there is a naked moment, especially turning around and covers himself up for a second and then fixes it. But there is like a naked human moment that that does happen. (laughs) When I saw that the first time, I was like, why is he dropping his pants in front of a bunch of kittens? (laughs) And so I kind of get it, but it definitely does not feel that way. And so it's it feels like, oh, I'm going to take my pants down. I guess (laughs) maybe it's because my amateur like just fan is not like putting the lyrics together to the action was just like what is he doing <laughs> so, okay i i can get that there's one there's a random sneeze yes what's that um, what is that uh oh crank uh, crank to shut the window if you sneeze uh is part of the the pantomime of that story moment um i think it's just before the naked moment too um that he's pantomiming opening the window of the the train car and one of the kittens just has a reaction that's just in time. Um, just happens to be perfect. Like, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and the other one that, that I still have not, this one, I still don't have, feel like I have a clear answer on, sure. which is, it looks like you hand something to old Deuteronomy. And I'm basing this off the 1998 movie. So maybe this okay. wasn't actually in your choreography. It could have been different, but it looks like you hand him a gift and it's something about handing him a mice or a mouse or something in there. Oh. Yes, um, that's that's towards the end of the story moment where uh, he sees a mouse on the floor and he stomps on it and uh, he grabs it off the floor. He throws a, an, an invisible mouse to Deuteronomy. It's like a, it is a pantomime moment as well. But Deuteronomy's just kind of – is that the moment you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, so, so why, why Deuteronomy? Like why give it to him? Uh, just homage because he's the, the leader of the tribe and he's giving him this moment to, to teach the children – um, so throwing it to him is like, this is our boss and he's just playing along and catching it as well to, to continue the joy of the moment. Because just before that, uh, was Gus, which in our tour, we did Gus and Growl Tiger, which is kind of a, it's a sad moment at the end because Gus walks off and we don't know what happens to him. So Skimble kind of brings it all back and it's kind of just bringing joy back into the, okay. into the junkyard. I, I, I read that as a bribe. I thought you a were trying to, yeah, <laughs> trying to get into the heavy side layer. Like, oh, okay. Old dude, I mean, you want, I know you want this mouse. <laughs> well, I want to yeah. throw it your I mean, way. You play, you play to the king, so and, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, see what you can do. Like, this is my turn. I'm gonna... I never thought of it that way. I always thought of it as a joke. Um, but was, no, you're absolutely right. It is a total bribe. I'm, I'm bribing the, if I'm you, I'm, I'm bribing the, the decision maker. <laughs> what about. For just in general, does, do you think Skimble actually believes there's even a chance for the Heaviside Layer? Or is he still just trying to keep stuff in order? Um, that year, uh, well, the, when I say that year, I mean like the night the show takes place. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think so. I don't think he thinks he's in contention that year. I think he's just kind of keeping everything going. And the reason he gets his spotlight moment is because because no one's been chosen yet. The the ritual that was supposed to happen didn't happen. And so everybody's kind of left like, huh? What, what, what do we do with this? And Skimble is used by Deuteronomy as a teachable moment um, to throw him a bone a little bit uh, in terms of keeping everything going, keeping everything moving. Um, but I, I don't think he thinks he's in contention that year. I think he still has a couple more years on him. 
Um, so, so that's interesting. So I, maybe that's maybe I've interpreted this differently. So you're saying that when we get to Skimble's song, it's because the ball ended and the decision has been made. And so it's just like we, we need to figure something else out to kill some time until we make a decision. And we're going to use our uncle to go tell us a story <laughs> and teach him and teach a lesson. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, that is what I'm saying. Um, Interesting. Yeah, because the whole the whole ritual of the ball, we're all there to do the Jellico ball, to do the ritual, to make the choice, you know, say goodbye, go home. And that doesn't happen. It happens every year. And the reason the show happens on the, – the reason we watch this show, this performance, the reason why this story tonight's being told is because this is the year it didn't happen. So when uh, Grizabella comes in, everything breaks apart. It doesn't happen. People are left confused. What do we do? It didn't happen. What do we do? And Deuteronomy realizes that he needs to bring everybody at, back because the tribe is kind of shattered, that we're not a, we're not a unit. So Fascinating. I have not taken this angle. I, let's keep going because I've got questions. <laughs> um, so the tribe is shattered. So he has to bring them all back together. So that's why he brings – that's why he sings um, Moments of Happiness to talk about we built up to this meaning and then the meaning didn't happen. So we're lost – in the approach to it and what do we do with that now and it's something ineffable that we can't place or but or feel and it's just jittery so that's when he brings out gus to talk to them about age and compassion and realizing just because someone's old and dingy um doesn't mean they don't have a story to tell even if it's a sad story um and then bringing someone in who is someone everybody knows and loves but you might not know that well and can learn a little bit more about him why He's such a stickler, why he's so um, detail-oriented, why he might be a little pushy, um, but he's always got your back. So that's kind of why he brings Skimble is to understand that kind of message as well. So I'm fascinated by this. Sure. And I, because I, let me tell you a little bit about how I interpreted this, and then I want to go into a little bit more about what you're telling me now. Okay. I have always thought that the Jellico ball is part of the whole experience, but really everybody is going to make their case. It's all about like, I'm going to go in and sing my story to make my case on why I'm there. And, you know, you could kind of debate a little bit about Tugger doesn't really care. He just wants to go make his case because it's just a spotlight. And you could kind of make those arguments, but that, that Jenny's making her case, that Tugger makes his case and you're making your case. So I actually never thought that the ball ends and that this is a unique like year mm -hmm. and Gus is going up to sing his part to say, this is why I should go. And then you go and you say, yeah, this is fun, but this is why I should go still. Mm -hmm. You're kind of saying that this is such a unique year because we, we got to the point we were supposed to make a decision and old Deuteronomy did not. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's kind of Grizabelle comes back. She ruins it for you. Mm -hmm. And so now we're act two, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like we're coming back yeah. from, from intermission. Is that what he's pondering? I guess is that older him is pondering what, what he's going to do on during intermission sitting Absolutely. on stage? Because it's like even saying act one, act two, it is, that's not a thing for us as the humans watching it. Yes. Lights come up and we all get a drink, but the, for the cats, for the story of the cats, it's one, it's the whole evening. That's why he stays on stage and you see him sitting and pondering because he doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know where to take the tribe from this because maybe this has never happened to him either or he's never experienced this also where choice wasn't made and it's on him to figure it out i, I again i love this because every time i talk to anybody about this show i get just a different version and mm -hmm. which is fascinating to me that the show can be in, interpreted that many ways agreed so i i like this because this dramatically changes the way you think about it mm -hmm. because now gus is not an, an opportunity i guess gus can't be the the jungle choice because um, we don't know that that's the thing he never i where where you're saying like they audition and are pleading their case no i'd say in, in your angle oh. you're saying the ball ends because grizabelle kind of ruins it before is either before he gets a chance to make his choice or maybe so i guess my question to you would be is in this scenario who do you think his choice was going to be that's a good question i was trying to think of the answer to that before we talked today and i still couldn't <laughs> land on anything <laughs> um i think I think the choice maybe might have been Gus, but I really don't. Um, I really don't know the answer to that. Um, it's a tough one. It's a, it's a very tough one. I think and, 
Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting. I think you, if if it, he's going down a path, and you know, really at this point, the choice is at that at, at that stage would be Gus, Jenny, and maybe McCavity. Like you're going to pick one of the older cats, and so your thought is old Deuteronomy is ready to make the decision is up to make the decision and then all of a sudden Grisabel comes in and he goes oh no i now yeah. not, i'm not sure mm-hmm. in that scenario my only kind of question or flaw is is what what is gus doesn't give a reason why he should go no the only, so i guess how would he have made the decision by that point um uh deuteronomy how deuteronomy yeah. um I don't know. I think, I think Gus is maybe okay with not going. Maybe like he lived the fullest life that he could live, and you know when you live the fullest life to to come back to another one that might not be the same, someone might be be okay with that. Um, so that's that's maybe why he's okay with not being picked. Um, and in terms of Grizabella, that that choice didn't come until later. He chooses. I think he chooses Grizabella to make a point. Um, and in terms of who he would have actually picked, I mean, maybe, maybe there is something to it showing off like Jenny and, um, who else in the beginning? Well, no, even Jenny's the only one who kind of showcases herself because she does, um, Gumby Cat and then every other number is Tugger's just interrupting to be a jerk. Yeah. I don't even I think it's like addition. Yeah. yeah. And then there's Mungo Jerry and Rumble Teaser, and yeah, they're not really up to Breaking it up anyway. Yeah. I <laughs> so this also dramatically changes the McCavity fight scene now. Because now maybe he's kidnapping old Deuteronomy because he thought he was the choice and was ready to go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, now, and and old Deuteronomy choked and didn't make the decision when he was supposed to. Yes. And now he's tinkering and McCavity's fuming back there while mm-hmm. Gus and Skimbo are doing their whole thing. And that's yeah. why he kidnaps and we get yeah. we get that, the, that scene. And that feeds into like the movie storyline with it where he's like stealing people so he can be the only choice. Mm-hmm. That I thought that was an interesting way to interpret that character that he's not he's not just mad at the Jellicles because they're the Jellicles and they're they're stupid and I don't like them. He's hurt. And he he wants to be back in that, and he thinks he deserves to be a part of that, and that kind of justifies that fighting for it, or even interrupting everything in the first place. I I, I, I love this because I again I've not examined the show from this lens, um, and it's always fun when it's different because now I'm like everything's turning like okay what else happens? Mm-hmm. Like yeah, you've got McCavity's song, mm-hmm. and then you've got you still have. Mistopheles, but that's mm-hmm. that would just be the end of the the McCavity fight. It's like oh, I brought him back here. I'm going to do a little showstopper, and then yes. at that point, Old Deuteronomy's had enough time to make his decision and says, "I'm going to teach the lesson and give Grizabella the choice, even mm-hmm. though it's out of out of the ordinary." Is this like a asterisk decision? It feels like it's a you know this Jellicle Ball is like the 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 Super Bowls where with a shortened <laughs> season or something. It's like you need you need an asterisk around here saying. This isn't a normal Jellicle choice. Like, did she really win? Um, maybe, but that's where it's up to interpretation as well, I think. Um, and yeah, it definitely maybe needs a little asterisk around it. But if you examine it enough, because when I talk to people about the show, I go on and on about the show, debating people and all this kind of stuff. Um, but what I find most of the time discussing it with people is people come from it like a very human lens that um they're here to do the even that the that the humans are are voyeurs in this situation like the humans aren't supposed to be there so the interpretation of the humans of the events that are going on are through through human eyes not through cat eyes so we don't always see the relationships we don't always understand what the connections are between them um so so what's the biggest argument you usually get into with people like what's the biggest conflicting piece that they don't understand uh that they're not supposed to be there <laughs> that um that the the humans it's not just buying a ticket and sitting down to see the cats put on the show it's it's an it's an avant-garde piece of musical theater it's a spectacle that you come in upon this space and you're interacting with animals yes they're people dressed as animals but they are animals so um 
putting the human side to some of the characters, even though, yes, there would be um, influence from their outside lives and stuff like that. Skimble being on a train and being dressed up and stuff like that. Like uh, humans, like my cat's right here. She, um, she takes on some of my behaviors as well. So I could see that being interpreted, but it's always from a cat's point of view, not a human's point of view. I'd say that's the biggest debate I get in with people. Yeah. I, that one I, I, I agree with is that this is a, you're just lucky to be witnessing the ball mm -hmm. and we're just there. It's not a performance for you. Yeah. I think it is interesting because when I saw it the first time, I, I kind of almost took it as a, I definitely took it as a performance as in who's going to give me the best performance in old Deuteronomy as the judge, but every show that's like that on TV, you know, the, those, those versions of that, there's an, an America voting capacity to it as well. So I was like, Oh, maybe we're just like the live audience. And we mm -hmm. have a say or don't have a say, or we're going to have a say later on. Yeah. Or maybe a different jellical year. But I, I definitely do feel that like, it's a, you know, they do, they talk to you at the end. They mm -hmm. do kind of like, they, they address you. Um, yeah. <laughs> but for the most part, it is just like a, almost a little bit of ignorance of like, yeah, fine. You can watch. Yeah. So I, I'm with you there. I've, but I, I don't, I'm still on the fence on if I think the ball. So I really, it is very interesting that the ball should always end with the decision. And this is the year that tradition was broken. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The ritual didn't happen. Hmm. It was built up to the meaning and then we didn't get it. But you get little memory. You do. But th I think that's what plants the seed for him to uh, choose her later whether it's um, a choice of her as making a point because the bigger issue is whether the Jellicle tribe will con continue or just fall apart. So picking her that he saw this, this very private moment and that when she comes back, everybody sees this private moment in front of, and they have the same reaction that brings everyone back together. I think that's the key to him choosing her is he, they, all the other cats got to see what he saw when before they were just shunning her and, and being bougie, you know? Yeah. Well, he's a cult leader. So at the he end is of the a cult day, also. he probably <laughs> wants to bring them back because he wants to keep his power and Absolutely. he's got to make a decision. <laughs> yes. And he, he felt like he messed light, up. You know? Yeah. yeah. He <laughs> felt like he messed up. I, uh, again, I love it. I love it. It's just so different from any way I've ever thought about it. I, cool. um, it's, it's, it's fun. It's fascinating. How much did eight year old you pick up of that? Uh, probably zero. None. Uh, none. <laughs> <laughs> I just saw dancing and leg warmers and I was in lights and sound and I was very yeah. happy and I saw a little bit of rock and roll. So I was all good. <laughs> okay. That's, that was my thing is I saw, I was like, wow, this looks really hard to do. I can't yeah. do that. I can't sing that. I was like, that's impressive. And then, yeah. and then me being the person who likes, to write and likes to um you know to analyze plots i was like there's some there's some challenges here mm -hmm. and and it's very clear how many challenges there are that i've recorded 40 50 episodes and oh, this wow. is the first time i've had anybody kind of really push that the jellico ball should have been the end and that this was a mistake year and this mm -hmm. is that mm -hmm. uh and I love it. That's what I love about it. But that's also what I hate about it because I, know, right? I want I want to write the story and it's clear that yeah. no one has written the story. There's like just loose interpretations and yes. every story has their own <laughs> slight tweak on this thing. <laughs> Let's do some rapid fire getting to kind of like the million sure. dollar question. Um, <laughs> one is, and you answered this for the eight-year-old you, which is you wanted to be Tugger. If you could play any cat, and you've played most of them, so I guess if you were going to get an opportunity, this is hard because you've played so many of them, but I usually ask, like, who would you want to play that you've never played? But sure. that's that's just, like, um, two people. I always – Tugger was always fun, um, but I always enjoyed playing Monk the most. So Monk that's my always, question. If you got to go on tomorrow, mm -hmm. you would that would be your answer. You'd I would want to be Monk a strap. Monk, I'd okay. Really, yes. It's um, just, just the the – because he always has this big, open, wide position, very making himself as big as he can. Um, and guys who usually get hired as monk, they're usually like six foot tall and above. And I'm like just under that. So I'm like just a little underwhelming. So I have to widen myself instead of making myself taller to, to, to give the full effect. Um, but just like the strength of 
being that open and being that wide. And um, I always enjoyed doing his makeup very much. The plot makeup for that was always very, very fun and challenging. And just his costumes, the, the, the black and gray striations and all that was just always my favorite one to wear. I felt very sexy in it. So <laughs> what about the inverse of that? Who was, if it's like, Oh, I got to do him tomorrow. Oh, um, Plato McCavity. Plato McCavity was always very hard. <laughs> what, what makes that one so difficult? Um, just because he's a cat that's all over the place that he starts as Plato as one of the Jellicles that he's not, has nothing to do with McCavity. Mm -hmm. Um, but he's, he kind of lifts everybody and is in the background a lot and then has to disappear to an act to be McCavity, um, which is a whole makeup change backstage. Like you do, I think three, three makeup changes as McCavity that you scrape it all off your face, put it back on, scrape it all off, put it back on, scrape it all off, put it back on. And the the big reveal where he's the fake Deuteronomy, where the right before the fight happens, is always hard because that coat is so huge, and it's this big. What we had was this big giant mask that was um, had a like a, a wig on the back, but had this like awful smelling plastic um, breath of all the cats that have ever worn it. Uh, interior like latex hard plastic that you have to pull off, and then you start the dance like rapid fire, and then you're lifting everyone in the world. Um, and then you electrocute yourself at the end. And, <laughs> and also the whole time, because the, the year I did, it wasn't with the revival that it was more of like a David Bowie labyrinth kind of, uh, McCavity look that it was, um, cat on fire that you had these big gloves with these huge, long black nails that were sewn onto the ends of these gloves. So you're trying to lift people in unitards wearing these big, long, like dainty gloves with these big plastic nails at the end. <laughs> so it's just all the obstacles in the world to make everything happen. It was, yeah. it was never fun to, to play Plato McCavity for me. <laughs> it is kind of interesting with it, that there's so many where there's multiple cats. Cause it's like, we definitely need for the orgy. We need as many people as possible. Of course. <laughs> but we can't, so we can't have like, just you just be gun us or you can just be this like it's always like you got to be a couple because we yeah. need the numbers yeah. um so I, I've, i'm always yeah and then and then talking about the the whole makeup change and costume mm -hmm. change and everything is an experience yes. um what's your um favorite and least favorite cat as in like character um least favorite i would say probably I would say Mungo Jerry, maybe. Ooh, why? <laughs> um, I just think he's a dick. <laughs> I, just <think> he's, <laughs> I just think he's a bit of a jerk. Um, just, I don't know. I just, just something about him rubs me the wrong way. <laughs> yeah, you can't describe it. Uh, yeah. That's, okay. Um, what about favorite? I also love that you started with least favorite because everyone is like, yeah, I love this person. And let me think about who I hate. You're <laughs> I just like, no, nah. it's hard to like, ah, I don't like Mungo. All right. Let me figure out who I like best. <laughs> um, favorite in terms of like who I, who I like to play or who I just like, just like, Oh, like, um, Tugger. Uh, yeah, I'm still going to, I'm going to stay true. Tugger. It's always, it's always going to be real. Right you still, me. still happy. Yeah. <laughs> what about your favorite song in the show? Uh, favorite like jam out song would be McCavity is always a really fun one to like be in the shower and do that. Um, but favorite song that touches my heart is always moments of happiness. Okay. It's so it's like, if you listen to the poetry of it and especially like the way I look at it, um, it's just a very haunting song and it kind of hits you in the gut with achieving that like ineffableness of what just happened, this unexplicable feeling that everyone's feeling. Mm -hmm. So yeah, McCavity has been my answer to that. And wasn't <laughs> when I first saw it, like the first saw it, it was Mungo Jerry and Ripple Teaser because oh, yeah. that one just got stuck in my head the most. <laughs> Not Skimble? <laughs> no, I, you know, I've, I've said this a couple of times. So I'll, I'll keep the story short, but I got blinded by the um, light the first time. Like when they pointed out into the crowd, oh, the it train? hit me. The train light hit me. Oh, my And gosh. so I was like, no. Nah. I was like, no, nah, I don't like this. So I think, honestly, I think a lot of my writing on Skimbo, like the creepy young was, I think this it's subconscious. I'm just like, still not a fan of this guy who, who blinded me for a half a second. Although it wasn't him, but that song. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, I, it is, it's a fun character to analyze because there's a mm. lot to it. Mm -hmm. um, my other kind of my new favorite question I've asked the last couple of people is, which cat do you think would be thriving in 2021? Ooh. Um, 
probably MongoJ and Rumpel Teaser because they would probably be good with like Bitcoin and all that kind of stuff. No. I think they would learn the internet by then. They're not the um, crypto cats of the yeah. crypto, the crypto <laughs> cats. They moved to dark web and they're doing they're doing just fine. I, I that's great. Which which <laughs> what uh did they start their own? Do you think they're starting their own crypto? Oh sure. Um <laughs> um Jellico coins for Jell- Jellico cats. Yeah, Jell coin. Jellicoid, yeah. <laughs> we're gonna that's what we're gonna start, right? It's you know, maybe it'll take off like like Doge. Let's go. <laughs> uh I, I love it. That's a great answer. I mean, that's what I like about this. There's I've heard a bunch of various ones, and there's there's no one said the same thing. Awesome. And ever for all various different reasons, and they all make sense. So I like that. Gel coin uh is going to be it's gonna take off. It's gonna you know, it's gonna go to a dollar to the moon. Let's go. Uh <laughs> to, the great. Moon. To, to the moon. moon. There you go. To the moon, yeah. So the heavy said layer. Um, okay, so my million dollar question, and I, I'm now very curious because I think you interpret the show so differently that you're probably going to say that Chris Bell is the right choice. But I want to hear your defense for it if it's her, and if not, who do you think should be the choice? Um, I, I'm going to stick with my choice that for this night, Chris Bell is the right choice for the longevity of the tribe for bringing everyone back together, for teaching vulnerability, because the Jellicles are jerks in the beginning. Everyone's not nice to each other. Um, so they need to learn They need to learn empathy for their tribe members, for their elders, for, for new kittens, for um, even people on the outskirts of the world that need help. Um, I think that's, that's the most important message, is to be welcoming and opening and, and um, compassionate. Uh, in terms of my choice for who it would have been at the end of the actual ball, I'm still gonna I'm gonna stick with ineffable on that because it's kind of it's kind of nice to not know. I think that it works it works in my favor a little bit. Yeah, um, that's the <laughs> that's the great way to not have to answer the yeah. question. Uh, yeah, you, you know we don't know. It's better if we don't know. Yeah, I you know I, I I'm still a little fascinated by that because you- I. Well, it depends on how you answer. I think the most okay. there's there's it depends on how you interpret the show, mm. which is what gets fun is because yes. the most I think the most if you look at it from just purely most worthy, then you can argue redemption for Isabella and she comes back. But if you're going to argue redemption, I think you could argue that for McCavity. Mm. If you want to argue who seems the most worthy because they've lived the fullest life and deserves a re, you know being reborn is probably Gus. Okay, yeah. If you look at it like a show of who gave the best performance then then it opens up a lot of like it's very subjective yeah agree and so it's either is america voting is the crowd voting (laughs) is it old deuteronomy voting Uh uh-huh what does that look like and that's always been my take is it's the x factor so i paired uh tugger and mustafelis and made them a joint boy band kind of like one direction (laughs) and and they go together yeah but that's i know that that's a very very narrow interpretation of the show and that's why it's fun because if I'm like now looking at your lens, I if I, when the ball ends, I, I don't think I'm even considering Gus mm-hmm. because he hasn't given me a reason. He's just like I would have already made that choice. Why would I use him again to kind of come back after? Mm-hmm. Which I also wouldn't consider Skimble or Mustafelis or anybody else. Mm-hmm. So I think that leaves you a pretty narrow choice. And I would, I argue, it would probably be Jenny. Yeah, because she came that. out, she showed what she's what she's got, and. And the ball ends, and she's still kind of like the oldest, most worthy choice mm-hmm. at that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's doing her community service. She's teaching yeah. the Beatles tap dance and and tatting and everything. You know, she's then she's her, a role model. You know, and her old friend comes in and ruins it. Fucking, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's fine. It's, it's a show. It's a show where like we've determined a cat is is sexually abused and raped. Like we can curse on the show. Like it's, oh, it's okay. It's there. <laughs> sorry, um, I got excited. Yeah, yeah. So I I do I, I am blown away. I, it's a different way to think about it. And now I'm going to be debating like, all right, well, and that angle what's going on here what's happening here and that's mm-hmm. why i think they're super fans that go see it multiple times Absolutely. because they can pick up different things and catch different stuff like that mm-hmm. yeah that's, and see uh, different, different interpretations too yeah. that's what's kind of nice handing it over to everyone because um i learned the show from richard stafford uh who set our tour and you know he's even said like so many people have played these roles like everything's kind of been done so um it's hard to find new things and you know people go to the same things because you know they are what they are but when someone finds something different that's what's always fun to bring people back Mm -hmm. 
crazy, crazy place. So 40 years later. Um, <laughs> right. It's the anniversary today. Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, during, during the recording, well, when I love recording it. This, when we're yeah. recording. So uh, how can we stay in touch, find you on social media, keep up with everything you're working on? Um, sure. Uh, I still teach. Uh, I dance after cats. I dance with a company called Strab Extreme Action. Um, I'm not, I'm retired from the company now. I danced there for eight years, uh, but I still teach there very frequently. I'm very involved in the space. So if you want to find them on Instagram, you can do at Streb Slam, S-T-R-E-B-S-L-A-M for more information about them. They're just coming back from pandemic and about to start doing performances. Um, also I'm involved with, uh, a group, my, uh, my friend has a, um, a hair shop, but I'm involved with DJing and creating art over there and things like that. So if you want to check that out, she's a really, really awesome person doing really, really cool things right now. You can find her on Instagram uh, at, at Hello Beautiful, just how it sounds um, on Instagram. Awesome. What about you? How do we find How do we stay in touch with you? Uh, oh, if you want to find me, if you want to follow me on the Instagram, uh, my name is uh, at Felix's Journey, Felix's underscore journey. And Love I have it. a leopard hat on probably. So yeah. you'll be able to find it. <laughs> Love it. Well, thank you so much for coming on, sharing sure. a little bit about Skimble, and then sharing a uh, an, an incredible different interpretation of the show that now I'm going to be thinking about for way more hours than I want to admit. Now and trying to, <laughs> yeah, now trying to break that version down. Awesome. This was really fun. Thanks for bringing me on. Thanks for challenging me too. Cause I, I love, love debating it. this show. So. I love it. Yeah. I mean, I, the one debate you said that's most common is something I, I was like, yeah, I, I agree with that one. So yes. I'm, I'm glad we could debate other things. Absolutely. Thank you for being here and thank you for listening to this episode of The Wrong Cat Died, the podcast breakdown of the cat's catastrophe. To follow along, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or anywhere else you listen to podcasts. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at The Wrong Cat Died. Or check out our website, thewrongcatdied.com.